All right, thank you very much for the song service. And now uh, let's turn our Bibles, go to Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4. As we continue to understand the book of Ephesians, we find ourselves now in uh, verse uh, 17, ultimately uh, going into the second half now of this uh, chapter. Uh, and in this chapter, it's all about our walk in righteousness. As you know, in the first half, it was walking according to the uh, calling by which we have been called. Again, the righteousness and holiness that God has created us. Now in the second half, it is that exhortation to walk in righteousness. And we see that in many negative examples that are given to us in the second half so that we do the opposite of those things. And specifically in the first two or three verses, as we have and begin that uh, first section of the second half, of the book, ultimately in verses 17 through 19, we understand how we should be walking today in the new life in which God has given to us versus the old life that we came out of, or that we've been called out of, and ultimately saved from. So that's what we're noting now, this uh, new walk in Christ, so that we don't walk as we did as an unbeliever when we were totally controlled by our sin natures. Now in verse 17, let's start there. <clears throat> It says, this I say, therefore, and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind. And again, the Gentiles here is used, used as a term to uh, deride ultimately the unbeliever. It's not just talking about the ethnic group of non-Jews, but ultimately it's talking about the pagan, unbelieving world that is out there. Then in verse 18, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And that's where we see ultimately the blackout of the soul as we're going to talk about uh, in the next coming week. They have uh, and then verse 19, and they, having become calloused, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. And that callousness is also what we term the scar tissue of the soul, which again is a, another stage or intensified stage of reversionism that we could fall into. So based on what we're seeing here, don't walk in that old manner of life. The hardening of the heart that the unbelieving world has towards God, again, they don't allow God or the light of God into their heart. They have scar tissue on their soul, which rejects the things of God. But we also understand that this is a book that is written to what? Believers. And how believers can also fall into that same type of trap that the unbeliever is already stuck in. Again, rejection towards God, negative towards His Word, and having that scar tissue built up on the soul so that they aren't receiving the things of God. So that has led us into the doctrine of reversionism, which we began on Thursday evening. And on Thursday evening, we uh, talked about a definition of what uh, the uh, reversionism is all about. And then tonight we're going to get into, or this morning I should say, we're going to get into some more principles and precepts in regard to falling into reversionism. So we're going to note that uh, as we go through. Again, as we are no longer to walk as the Gentiles also walk. And notice what it says at the end, in the futility of their mind. And that is that Greek word that means vanity. And you know the Hebrew uh, Ecclesiastes that Solomon wrote, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. He began the book of Ecclesiastes with that. He ends the book of Ecclesiastes with that. And in between were those great experiments that he tried to portray to try to find happiness somehow in this world. But at the end of all of that, he said, there is no true happiness. There's no lastingness, uh, uh, lasting happiness of the things of this world, but only through God and having his word resident in your soul do you have that true inner peace, happiness, and contentment. So vanity of vanities, all is vanities. And Paul picks up on that. Don't walk in the vanities of your former life. Again, that emptiness, that worthlessness, that futility that is in their mind, that is in their mindset where there is no really great relationship. There is no relationship with the unbeliever with God. And for the believer, they can fall away from their relationship with God and have that futility of their mind. All right, so that gets us into the doctrine of reversionism. I just want to quickly give you some of the definition again. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, <clears throat> and you've seen and talked about these things in the past. But by definition, basically, it's an act of reversing the direction you were heading in. You were going forward in the plan of God. You were following Him consistently. You were taking in the Word when it was being taught by your right pastor teacher at your local assembly. You were studying. You were praying. You were going forward. You were learning. You were growing. 
but for whatever reason, something happened in your life where all of a sudden you became distracted from that relationship with God, and then you reverse that direction and you go in ab absolutely a different direction. In other words, you go away from God. And it's not an intentional walk away from God at first, but it's the subtleties of life that come into the, to your life that distract you away from your relationship with God, distract you away from the intake and application of Bible doctrine. And then if you let that go unchecked within your soul, eventually it really starts to take hold or that reversionism or the negative aspect of your walk with God really starts to take hold. And it leads you further and further astray where ultimately you can then be antagonistic towards God and the teaching of His Word. So when we talk about reversionism, again, it's a reverse process. It's a reversal. You were going in one direction towards God. Now you're going in a complete opposite direction called sin and Satan's cosmic system. And uh, just bef uh, before I get into this, the last part of that uh, the slide that I had up there, you know, this is something that you either actively choose to do or you receive the action of the verb as well. So again, because of Satan and his cosmic system, because of the temptations of your sin nature, you can receive the process of your reversal of walk. Instead of walking with God, again, sin and temptation, the world comes into your life and it starts to lead you astray. It starts off very subtly at first, but then over time it can be very exaggerated within your life. And I've told you, I've used that example many, many times in the past, but you know, if there's a, a little crack in the uh, cliff of, uh, you know, if you look at a cliff and you see the rocks and all that are up there, and I'll use the example. Remember the old man in the mountain that used to be up in New Hampshire, okay? And there was all kinds of cracks and crevices all over that. And because of the water that would get into the cracks and then during the winter freeze and expand, those cracks and crevices became bigger and bigger and bigger. And then the state tried to come in and try to patch it with all kinds of epoxies and all kinds of different things to hold it up there. But then all of a sudden, one night, people woke up and the old man in the mountain was no longer there. He was gone, okay? Now, if I was to use this in a correct application, I would say the new man. Right? The new man in the mountain, rather than the old man in the mountain, because we don't know what the old man is. But if it was the new man in the mountain, again, you as a believer going forward, if you let those cracks and crevices be filled with the garbage and the details of life and Satan's cosmic system, eventually those cracks and crevices are going to get bigger and bigger and bigger, and ultimately your life is going to fall apart. Your life with God is going to fall apart. Your spiritual life is going to be in tatters and uh, be shattered, and you won't have that same inner peace and happiness and contentment that you had once before. But after I get through the definition, I'm going to start to talk about uh, the eight cycles of reversionism that we can fall into. And ultimately, in those eight cycles, we see how the crack you know, gets filled with more and more garbage. And ultimately, then the world tries to come in and try to fill it with epoxy and try to fill that hole or that crevice that is in your soul that would be filled by God in His Word. And we see how even that is futile and ultimately the life will fall apart. So <clears throat> again, that was a pretty good example. What do you think about it that just came? So thank you, Holy Spirit. But in any case, it is a decline of our spiritual growth. Ultimately, it is uh, when you can be in super grace. Again, you could be a mature believer. You could be in the Word of God for years and years and years and be ultimate at the echelon of the spiritual life. But again, if you allow the cracks to be filled with the garbage and the details of life, if you give uh, the sin nature a foothold within your soul, it can just, you know, once it gets a foothold, it just keeps going more and more and more. Because that sin nature just wants to grab it more of you, grab it more of you, grab it more of you, and take away more of your life. And certainly take away your spiritual life in totality. And it's all part of Satan's cosmic system. And Satan works with that sin nature to try to lead you astray, to try to distract you from your spiritual life and your spiritual walk and get you outside of God's plan for your life. So... Ultimately, when we talk about it, it's being controlled by the old sin nature. You go back into the evil and human good and uh, 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 any wickedness or rottenness you might have been into prior to that. And this is analogous with terms that we see in the scriptures called uh, backsliding and also apostasy. 
King James Bible uses the word backsliding a couple of places, but apostasy is another word that we see uh, throughout the English translation of the New Testament. These are words that are synonymous with reversionism. Other phrases that we also see, and we studied these in a little bit of detail on uh, Thursday night, so I'm not going to go into them uh, in detail this morning, but several of these other synonymous terms or phrases for reversionism means the uncircumcised of the heart. Again, you have that scar tissue built up on the soul. It hasn't been removed. It hasn't been cut away. Falling from grace. Again, you were walking in the grace plan of God. Now you're falling away from that, and you've uh, fallen from the grace plan and operation that God has for you. Also, the shipwreck of the soul. And again, that's a great analogy, puts in the mind's eyes. Ultimately, you are traveling and traversing across the, the sea, whether it be a rough sea or whether it be a calm sea. Ultimately, now you have a shipwreck of your soul, and you've run aground, and now the ship is being torn apart, as you know. That is a great analogy of what can happen to our soul that we can traverse in good times or in bad when we have God within our soul. We're going to see some passages and scriptures this morning about Paul and the contentment that we can have and that he had in all situations. Again, when we run aground or have shipwreck of our soul, we're not content with our life. We're not content with the things that God has given to us, and we're always looking for something more, something more, something more to fill in those gaps. Again, coming short of the grace of God, that's kind of falling away from the grace of God. And then that great verse in uh, Revelation chapter 3, ultimately being a Luke warm believer. You are neither hot nor cold. You are neither hot on fire. Again, uh, and, and what does heat have? It has a soothing uh, aroma to it or a soothing uh, type of ministry. You don't have that. You don't have a cold or refreshing ministry. You don't have either one of those. You're lukewarm. You're somewhere in, the, in, in between that really has no value whatsoever. So again, the lukewarm believer is the reversionistic believer who's not going forward inside the plan of God. And then also, uh, if you want to see a profile of the reversionistic believer, Psalm chapter 7, verses 14 through 16. All right, so again, give us a little bit of a definition and understanding as to what reversionism is. Now I want to talk about these eight stages of reversionism that the apostate believer can fall into. Because these are great uh, you know, uh, uh, stages that we uh, uh, need to understand within our life because all of us have fallen into these things. I'll say all of us have fallen into these things at one point or another. And then some of us may have this more prevalent within our lives. And as we see, it's kind of a, a progression that happens to us on a consistent basis. When we start with the just little subtleties of skipping a class or not being fervent in our prayer life or, you know, missing out here, missing out there, all of a sudden it, the, the missing out and the relationship that we have with God becomes less and less and less. But it stops suddenly where we don't even realize it, but then ultimately it becomes greater and greater within our lives. And so I want to go through these things and also remind you that, <clears throat> you know, Pastor Theme put these uh, together and, uh, you know, using the outline of uh, what he had put together for this uh, many years ago. But ultimately we see that this isn't, you know, one after another after another, but it's kind of like that snowballing effect. It's kind of like, you know, you start with a little bit here, and then as the snowball starts to roll down the, the hill, it picks up a little more snow, a little more snow, a little more, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and ultimately that's what happens with these eight stages. Again, it gets a little bit bigger, it starts off subtly, a little, little, little small snowball, and then it builds to a huge mountainous snowball as a result in your spiritual life. So remember, these things overlap. It's not necessarily sequentially as we see here, but again, it is somewhat sequentially, but it snowballs over time is the best way that we can understand this. Now, the first thing that we do is that we have what we call the reaction factor. Now, as you know, and we teach the Word of God that in life, we ought to respond to life situations, respond to our right man, our right woman, respond to the Word of God, and respond to the problems, difficulties, and disasters that we have in life. But yet, if we react to those things, which has the negative connotation of your old sin nature and the bitterness and anger and jealousy that may be within your life, if you react to things in life, that is a negative connotation and the sin nature is now loose and in control of your soul. And what happens is, is that for whatever reason, you know, we, uh, we get a little bit dissatisfied with the things in life. 
and we get a little bored or we get a little bit lazy or we get a little bit of something that, you know, maybe I deserve this or maybe I deserve that. And we start to react to the things uh, that uh, are going on in our life rather than responding to them with the Word of God. And what that does is when we get into the reactionary mode, ultimately we are not utilizing the Word in our soul. We're not responding with doctrine to life situations. If somebody cut you off in the street, do you just react negatively and hit your horn and then follow them home, you know, tailgating them the whole way in anger? Do you react that way? Or do you, uh, you know, respond in love and love your neighbor as you love yourself and ultimately give them a break and say, well, maybe they're having a bad day or maybe there's something going on or uh, unfortunately they're on the cell phone like they should not be, okay? So how do you respond versus how do you react? So again, if you react to things in uh, situations, ultimately we're not applying Bible doctrine. And this all begins where we're not utilizing the Word of God within our lives, and instead we are using other things, other mentalities from our sin nature and Satan's cosmic system to react to situations rather than responding with God's Word. So as you can see, as I have up on the board, it leads us in a little subtle negative volition towards the Word of God. Rather than applying it, again, you reject it and you react based on your old sin nature. And so because of different things that come in our lives, discouragement, boredom, disillusion, self-pity, again, feeling sorry for yourself, you know, failures that you may have uh, in your life, or even that loneliness that some people have, oh, why don't I have more friends, or whatever the case may be, or any type of adverse situations. And again, this is a short list of many, many things that can come into our life that leads us to react to life rather than respond. But because of these things, again, frustrations build up on our soul. And for many of us, it's like, well, why do they get this and I don't? Or why do they have this and I do not? Again, it's kind of chasing after the Joneses, as we call it, rather than uh, understanding that God has a plan for your life. So when you have various frustrations on the job, at home, in your relationship, again, rather than handling those frustrations in a good way with the Word of God and Bible doctrine, you react. And you react in anger, or you react with bitterness, or you react somehow with your old sin nature. Again, when you first do that, it's just a sin. Name it, incite it, and then move on. And start to apply Bible doctrine. That's just carnality. But reversionism is when you let that thing go. When you let the wound fester, as we would call it. When you let that continue to happen within your life over and over again. And you start to, again, be more self-centered about yourself and think that you deserve this or you deserve that. So you react to things and life in a very negative way rather than applying Bible doctrine and God's Word. And ultimately, you try to solve those frustrations. Rather than turning to God, you look to things in the world to try to satisfy your wants, your needs, and your desires. And it's interesting when we talk about the reactor factor, okay? You know, and and again, it's a negative connotation, a negative term, and, and used in a great way. And when you react to things, what happens? Again, you know, you start to respond emotionally in anger and bitterness, and you, you start to boil over within your soul, and you, you know, you start to get angry at all this. Before you know it, you're going to blow. You know, and there's a reason why they call the thing that runs our nuclear power plants a reactor, okay, <laughs> that is ready to explode at any point in time. But what do they do in the nuclear reactor? They try to contain it. They try to, you know, you know uh, uh, patch it up, make sure it's, it, it can only react so much and keep it under wraps. But if they let that go, what happens? You have nuclear meltdown, and now the power plant blows up, and now you have nuclear you know, fallout all over the place. You have a huge disaster. And again, the same thing can happen to us in our spiritual walk if we don't control the reaction factor, if we don't apply Bible doctrine and, you know, take note of these things and don't let them get out of control, name it, incite the sin, rebound, confess it, and then get back into the plan of God and call out for the Holy Spirit to lead you to the application of the Word so that you don't continue the negative trend, the negative trend, and ultimately have the, you know, the reactor ultimately boil over within your soul. So, as we say, this is reacting negatively towards Bible doctrine. And it's interesting, you know, and and, and a lot of these words are very harsh, and you're going to see some more, and frantic you're going to see in a little bit, and negative reaction towards Bible doctrine. 
you know, negative reaction towards Bible doctrine doesn't mean that you have to, you know, say, oh, I hate the Word of God, or I can't stand the pastor, or I don't want to take in the Word. You know, negative volition towards the Word of God is simply not using it and tur turning to something else to apply that something else within your life. And we're going to see a list of things coming up, but, you know, sometimes that can be drugs or alcohol or it can be, you know, various situations of life. So, you know, that negative volition towards Bible doctrine doesn't mean, uh, you know, you're, you're hating doctrine and you're antagonizing it, you know, directly. It just means you're not applying it because it's not that important to you. Now, later on, if you let that go long enough, you can become very antagonistic towards God and His Word and, you know, hate God, hate His Word, hate the pastor, hate the church, whatever the case may be, if you let the nuclear reactor, uh, you know, boil over. But it doesn't start that way. It starts very subtly by just not applying it. So, again, we have to, all, you know, think about all the things we do throughout our days and are we applying doctrine here? Are we applying doctrine there? Or am I trying to solve my problems in my own way? Or am I trying to satisfy some urge, need, lust, or desire that I may have in my soul in my own way, in my own time? What are we trying to do? Let's go to Romans chapter 12 and let's look at a couple of passages there. And again, this is a very familiar verse and a great verse, as uh, we understand and know, because many applications come from it. But this is telling us what we should do so that ultimately we don't have the reactor factor within our life. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, we'll stop there. It says, I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You see, conformity to this world is the reaction factor. You know, you should have this, you should have that. What does the world say about solving this problem? What does the world say about solving that problem? What is my old sin nature leading me to do? That's conformity to the world. The unbeliever lives like that. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. For through the grace given to me, I say to every man among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. And God has given you all faith so you all have the opportunity to believe in God, trust in God, rely upon God. But when you think more highly of yourself than you ought to think, it's all about you, me, myself, and Irene, as I like to say. It's all about you. It's all about you. It's all about you and what you should have and what you should be doing. But again, we should recognize God has a plan for our life, and our God is a gracious God and a blessing God. And if God wants us to have it, He'll give it to us. If He doesn't, then so be it as well. It's the best thing for us because, again, Father knows best, as we like to say. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. Again, towards the back end of the New Testament, after Thessalonians, then 1 Timothy 6. Now, I'm going to only go through the first four of these if I can get through the four. And then on Tuesday, we're going to come back and talk about the last four of these stages of uh, reversionism or the cycle of reversionism that we can fall into. But in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, it says, If anyone advocates or teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words or sound Bible doctrine, those of our Lord Jesus Christ and with... Uh, and with the doctrine conforming to godliness, he is conceited or arrogant and un understands nothing. But he has a morbid interest in controversial questions and dispute disputes about words, out of which arise envy, strife, abusive language, evil suppositions. Then in verse 5, and constant frictions between men of depraved mind and deprived of the truth who suppose that godliness is a means of gains. So yes, in view here is the false teacher of false doctrines, but you can also see the mentality of the reversionist that can fall down that slippery slope of reversionism and think that it's all about you know, their thoughts, their opinions, and what they want and what they need. 
rather than applying what the Word of God has to say. What does God want for me? What is God doing in my life? What would God have me do in this situation? And what does His Word say about that? Again, that's the application of Bible doctrine so that ultimately we live in godliness and we continue to walk in righteousness and not get sidetracked by our sin natures beginning in carnality, but then letting that go unchecked, which could lead to all kinds of reversionism within our life. So the reactive factors combined with the difficulties that come in our life, combined with indifferences or the lack of exposure uh, to the Bible and, and, and doctrinal teaches, uh, teaching, causes the reactive factors to have a negative influence over your life. Again, if we let these things go unchecked, if we don't you know, uh, 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 catch ourselves from reacting because of the arrogance or the pity or whatever may be in our soul, ultimately these things are going to take root and it's going to become the way of our life. And then everybody that cuts us off in the street, we're going to be angry and mad and upset. We're going to be following everybody home at night and not knowing what we're doing and what we should be doing rather than continuing to go forward inside of God's plan. Don't let this have an influence over your life. And don't let the cracks come in because the little shimmer will lead to a gaping hole within your soul. So then the second stage, again, that is also, again, a little bit part of the first, but then becomes accentuated as we get to this second stage, is what we call the frantic search for happiness. And again, the word frantic there is kind of harsh and, you know, kind of strong to begin with. And it doesn't start off necessarily with that franticness of, you know, being kind of out of your mind. But subtly we could just say the search for happiness, the search for happiness outside of God his word, his will, and his plan for your life. When you search for happiness in other things. And again, there's a lot of things that Satan has put into this world for us to search after. A lot of things that you can go to on your TV, go to on the internet, drugs, alcohol, in society. There's a lot of things that Satan has built inside of this world that, quote unquote, are designed to give us happiness. And again, it's all part of Satan keeping the cold water on the nuclear reactor, so ultimately it doesn't blow. But the fact of the matter is, Satan's cold water doesn't hold water, okay? And ultimately, it can't do a thing for you. And there may be some pleasure that you gain here and gain there for a minute or for a moment, but it's very fleeting, as you know. But the happiness that God has is a lasting happiness, and it can get you through the strong winds and the storms and the turmoil that we just read, read about in verses 14 uh, down through 16. It can get us through the turmoils of life, the problems and difficulties of life. And it can get you, if it can get you through that part of life, what is it going to do for you in the good times as well? It's just going to make it better. And now you're going to be able to enjoy the good things of life in a righteous way and in a holy way and have pleasure of the things that God blesses you with in this life. So again, going back to the frantic search for happiness, again, it's the reaction to the reactive factors that follows the patterns of the old sin nature. And again, I've said to you a, a bunch of times already, I can't wait to get to heaven and truly understand, like from a microscope standpoint, what this old sin nature is all about. How does it have its own thought process? How does it have a, an ability to tempt us on a day in and day out basis? How does it work within our soul? Again, from a scientific standpoint is more what I'm uh, curious about because it's absolutely amazing. It's absolutely amazing that this thing is inside of us. Adam and the woman didn't have, have it initially in the Garden of Eden. And they only had thoughts of you know, holiness and righteousness and everything was good in what they did. But then ultimately when they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, now they had the knowledge of good and evil inside of them. And now they had a, a nature inside of them that we call the Adamic nature, the old sin nature, the dead, the dead nature that is inside of each and every one of us now as we're born into this world. What is that thing? But that thing has power. That thing has resources. That thing has ability to control your soul. As an unbeliever, we had no option against it. But now as a believer, we have all the world against it. And again, the world of God, the world of His Word, the world of the Holy Spirit, we have all of that that can fight against that old sin nature so that we're no longer controlled by it. 
So in the frantic search for happiness, we are led by that sin nature to seek out pleasure and happiness from the world, to try to fill the gaps of our uh, frustrations, to fill the gap of our self-pity, to fill the gap of our loneliness or the things that we think we deserve or should have in this life, to fill the gap of the lust that we have going on. Let's look at now in our Bibles. Let's go to 2 Timothy. I think you're in 1 Timothy. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verses 4 and 5. <clears throat> 2 Timothy uh, uh, chapter uh, 3 in verses 4 and 5 specifically, but let's go back to uh, uh, verse 1 here. It says, but realize this, that in last days difficult times will come, for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, and avoid such men as these. And then it goes on to say a little bit more about those individuals. But again, what do we see? Avoid such men as these. Again, this is what the world is all about. These are the things that describe the worldly viewpoint. And believers can get right involved in that if they don't allow the Word of God to penetrate their soul and be applied on a consistent basis. These are the types of things we need to be avoiding on a consistent basis. And as we also say, you know, I mean, again, in our doctrine tonight, we're talking, or this morning, we're talking about ourselves and how we can have that negative reaction and uh, things happen inside of us. But remember what we just noted is that other people function and operate in this way and that we should avoid them at all costs. In other words, avoid the worldly thinker. Avoid those who are living inside of Satan's cosmic system, whether they be a believer or an unbeliever. And when I say avoid them, I mean, you know, don't hang around with them and associate them in wholeheartedness to what they're doing. And don't just live it up as they're living it up. Again, you have to differentiate yourself and sometimes separate yourself from them because their negative influence will ultimately penetrate your soul and eventually you'll be dragged away from doctrine too even more so than maybe you already have been dragged away. So again, we are to, uh, uh, you know, associate with these individuals. But again, you know you need to be around them from time to time to witness to them and to hopefully evangelize the unbeliever and then exhort uh, the uh, believer who may be in reversionism. So you've got to have that type of, you know, interaction with them. We understand that. But you shouldn't be associating with them on a consistent basis because their negative viewpoint is going to become your negative viewpoint, especially if you don't have the strength of doctrine penetrating and working within your soul. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 13. Let's look at that passage. <clears throat> Again, go back, back, back to Titus. Then you get the book of Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, it says, Let your character be free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. So that we confidently say, The Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What shall man do to me? So again, never have fear, worry, or anxiety about today or tomorrow or the next day. Ultimately, God is with you. And if you are walking inside His plan on a consistent basis, He will be there for you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll never desert you. I'll always be there for you. But as we see in the first part of verse 5, let your character be free from the love of money, being content with what you have. You see, the love of money is what Satan wants us to have. The love of money is chasing after the world, chasing after the world. And I need this, I need that, because everybody else has this and that. Again, if God blesses you, nothing wrong with that. But never let those things be a distraction away from your will, or excuse me, your walk with God and His will for your life. Never let those things be a distraction. 
you can enjoy those things, and God will give, uh, bless you uh, from time to time with those things. But never let that be a distraction. And never let it be a desire where you want more, 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 more. Again, you know, if, you've, if He's given you a blessing, be content with that blessing. And if He gives you something more in the future, then so be it. But don't be chasing after it and desiring it and lusting it because you don't have it today. Be content with what God has given you and then go forward in His plan in your relationship with Him, enjoying what He has given to you and provided uh, to you. <clears throat> So as we talk about the old sin nature, remember there are two trends to that sin nature. One is a trend towards lasciviousness, which is, again, a kind of antinomianism, another word that we talk about. But again, it's against the law, it's immorality and things like that. And then there's another trend in our sin nature that's tr towards asceticism where we get involved in legalism and human good and approbation lust, where we want a pat on the back and we want people to think good about us on a consistent basis. Our sin natures trend in both directions. And in both directions, there's a lust pattern or a lustful desire that can take over our soul to lead us in one or the other or sometimes even both directions. And each of us have, again, uh, you know, weaknesses towards one or strengths towards the other. Again, where we function and operate in one side or the other, sometimes even in both. But both of them are utilized by your sin nature to get you to pursue happiness. Again, outside of God's word, will, and plan for your life. Again, it's, it leads you to pursue happiness. Again, that false and fleeting forms of happiness that are there inside of Satan's cosmic system, but it leads you, it drives you, and it tempts you to go in those directions. So again, just to give you some graphic, again, we have our old sin nature. We've got the strengths and weaknesses of our sin nature, the kind of things we gravitate to. And then we have asceticism, which is on the right side, which is towards a, a, a legalistic a, a, a morality that is man-made and human good. And again, that approbation lust that we desire because we're doing good and we want pats on the back on a consistent basis. And then the other trend is towards lasciviousness, again, that kind of license to sin aspect that we talk about. And then overlaying all of this in, inside of us in nature is the lust patterns of the soul. And again, what are you desiring? What are you lusting after? What do you, you know, uh, you know uh, how is your sin nature tempting you consistently to have, you know, your, your tongue hanging out of your mouth and drool going down to the floor? I want that, I want that, I want that. Okay, you like, like cartoons with the dog hanging out of the mouth. He's like, ah. okay. That's the sin nature inside of us. Again, the lust patterns of our soul. And it, you know, can lead you in a direction to be a goody two-shoes, or it can lead you into another direction, being an evil individual in this world, as the world would call about it, uh, or call it. But in both cases, goody two-shoes or the evil rotten person, Again, if you're doing those things for the wrong motivation and in the wrong way, again, a counter to God's will and word uh, and plan being in your life, both of them are sin and evil in your life, and both of them can lead you to reversionism very, very easily. So if we trend towards asceticism, again, we lust the praise, the, the desire of other people to pat us on the back, that approbation that we call the approval of others. Again, we lust that, and we can get involved in things like religion and legalism. Again, the goody two-shoes where you got to do this and you got to do that. And that's where religion and many quote-unquote Christian churches have really expounded, and they keep their people locked in. Because in their soul, there's a trend towards, again, asceticism. Oh, if you just do X, Y, and Z, you'll be a good Christian. If you do A, B, C, and D and keep doing that throughout your life, you may make it to heaven. And if you keep trying, trying, maybe you will. But only God will tell you at the end. But they try to lock you in because they know that that's a trend of the old sin nature. And religion is famous for doing that. Many of our Christian denominations these days are also getting involved in the lasciviousness side, which is the more liberal side, and anything goes. And now you see women pastor teachers who are predominantly homosexuals, not all of them, but many of them, and you see the acceptance of homosexuality and openness and gay pride and all that stuff in a very open way. 
Well, that'd just be like saying, okay, everybody in the church, commit adultery tonight and you'll be okay tomorrow. It's fine. It's okay. Or Everybody, let's pass the bottle around. Let's all get drunk and shoot up with heroin. We'll all be okay. It's getting pretty graphic here, right? Okay. But that's the mentality, okay? And again, one sin is just as bad as the other. And you see in religion, you see asceticism, you see the lasciviousness, and you see uh, the, uh, the, the uh, liberalism coming to the fore. Again, in the ancient days, all the false religions were steeped in what? Yeah, there was a ritualistic lifestyle that they had to do with all their sacrifices and things that they had, but tied into that was the lascivious side where, again, prostitution and homosexuality was rampant in all of those religions. And again, it's because Satan knows how to influence different people with their sin natures, whether they're going to go this way or whether they're going to go that way, and he just tries to call them in. And it's all a counterfeit to the truth of what God's Word has to say. So again, these are the trends that can happen within our soul. And as I said, it doesn't start off with the egregious as I just gave you some examples, but it starts off subtly. A little bit here, a little bit there, a little acceptance here, a little acceptance there. But before you know it, you have whole religions and denominations being totally apostate and reversionistic in their teaching and in their process and in their administration. And then you see that in the world as well, and uh, getting greater influence in a society like the United States of America is today. And it's all counterfeit, what? To the Christian way of life. And you're trying to mask the things that are going on in your soul. You're trying to mask them and cover up the hurt and the pain and the, uh, the sorrow or whatever it may be within your soul or the lust that you have. You're trying to cover all that up with the garbage of Satan's cosmic system rather than turning to the Word that gives you complete answers and fulfilled answers for all things in life. Again, God's Word has everything we need for this life. And you can have a fantastic mentality with, you know, positive volition and happiness and joy and peace and contentment and live a very exhilarating life when you have God in your life each and every step of the way. He is, our souls were designed for it to be filled by Him. But if we're not filling it with Him, ultimately Satan is going to fill it in with his garbage, his epoxy, and try to get the whole man to fall down. Now, the other side is lasciviousness, so we've talked about this, so I won't go into too much uh, detail uh, uh, further. But the last point there is people try to, you know, fill the holes and gaps of their life with stimulation and exhilaration. And that's what the lascivious thing is all about, whether it be drugs or alcohol or sex or whatever other, you know, anything goes type of lifestyle is all about. They're trying to stimulate their life. They're trying to stimulate their soul with the garbage of Satan's cosmic system. And as you know, if you, you know, uh, try to stimulate uh, your soul, yeah, some of those things, and even the Word of God says for a season it gives you pleasure, and it may be exhilarating or stimulating for a moment, but once the moment's gone, it's gone, and you have no lasting stimulation, no lasting exhilaration. And that's why the alcohol abuser or the drug addict always has to get the next high, the next high, the next high, because they're always trying to get back to that feeling, get back to that place. You see, the believer with the Word of God always has that feeling, always has that place. And so whatever it is in our lives, yeah, drug and alcohol, it's easy to point to those things and talk about addiction, but addiction can come in any form. And there are many things that you could be addicted to in this life. And some people can be addicted to betting. Some people can be addicted to going to sporting events. Some people are addicted to riding roller coasters. And where's the best roller coaster I can go? And they travel the world to go over the best roller coasters. Or they get exhilarated by a rock band, and they follow them from city to city to city, you know, and basically waste their life following them around. You know, you heard it once. Isn't that enough? You know, maybe next year you hear it again. But do you have to hear it night after night after night after night and follow them everywhere they go? Again, you're addicted to that thing. And so addictions again, can come in all of these forms. Sometimes even criminal activity can be become an addiction, but you get involved in all kinds of things that maybe you otherwise would not get involved in. 
And in both searches for happiness, again, you're trying to replace the happiness that God has for your life. And again, that can come with His Word and, again, being filled with the Spirit and His Word resident in your soul. That's going to give you all the happiness that you would want, need, or desire within this life. But again, they're trying to fill it up with the garbage of Satan's cosmic system. Let's look uh, in... uh, Uh, Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. Let's look at these couple of scriptures. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Let's go back a few pages and we'll go to Philippians. First Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 12. It says, But godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. For we have brought nothing into the world, so we can take nothing out of it either. And if we have food and covering, with these we shall be content. But those who want or desire to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires, which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. Again, it's not the root of all evil, but all sorts of evil. And it's not just money, it's the love of money. That's what's in view. Again, but the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. And some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Again, that's the birth pains uh, a scenario. Many, many uh, uh, pains and injuries. Verse 11, but flee from these things, you men of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness, Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, and you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. All right, now let's go to uh, uh, Philippians chapter 4. Let's turn back to Philippians, and I'm going to leave you with this verse. Again, just after the book of Ephesians, so Philippians chapter 4. And here's uh, Paul's uh, great uh, passage on contentment that we should have and inner peace and happiness. And uh, verse 10, it says, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last you uh, you, you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Now, here's the point. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means. I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. So again, that is a great charge that we should all have in our hearts in verse 13. I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. And what strengthens you? Again, the Word of God, which is the mind of Jesus Christ and the filling and the power of God the Holy Spirit. And whatever life has for you, again, be content. And be content with that. And keep going forward in the plan of God. And don't be searching after this and searching after that and looking at a frantic search for happiness. And as I said, you know, the search for happiness begins subtly at first. And it's just, okay, a little pleasure here, a little pleasure there. But if you let that go unchecked, which we're going to pick it up on Tuesday night with, again, it can become a very frantic search for happiness. And that's, again, the addiction comes in, and I've got to have it, I've got to have it, I've got to have it. And it becomes frantic. And you go all over the place, and you search high and low to get that thing, for that high, that exhilaration, that stimulation, and you do it in many different ways, whether that be uh, in legalism in the church, uh, of, of uh, in, uh, again, the approbation lust, or whether it be the lascivious immorality that we can also get involved in. But instead, we ought to be following our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, each and every day. Fill your soul with the Word of God. Fill the cracks that you may have with the epoxy of Jesus Christ, which is unbendable, unbreakable, and is eternal and lasting. And you will be the new man in the mountain forever and ever and ever. All right, so we'll close there. And ultimately, uh, let's bow our heads and uh, close our eyes. Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for giving us this uh, kind of wake-up call and also exhortation to not fall into the reversionistic type of lifestyle, but instead continue to be fervent for you and your word and 
you know, lust after and desire after your word rather than the things of this world. And so, Father, we just ask that you fill up our hearts and souls more and more each and every day so that we're not looking in, uh, for things in this world and we're not being sidetracked or distracted, but instead we continue to have rejoice in you. So, Father, we ask that you uh, be with us in the closing portions of our service this morning. In Christ's precious name, amen. All right, so thank you very much for that uh, portion of our service. And now is our time where we have an opportunity to give to the Lord, and give in thanksgiving and appreciation for His Word, and also so that we can continue to further His Word in, throughout this local area, through our local assembly, and then also throughout the world. So as uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 7, let each one do just as he purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So again, never give because your arm is twisted, but give because you want to give and you desire to give, and again, uh, doing it with joy in your heart. So let's just uh, pray right now for our offering. Father, we just thank you for this time of uh, opportunity to give to you the first fruits of all that you've given to us. We ask that you bless and multiply these things so that ultimately your name is proclaimed far and wide. And your son, Jesus Christ, as well, through this local assembly. In his precious name we pray. Amen. Amen.